Our scripture for this morning is Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 to 9. Please stand for the reading. Please stand for the reading of the word. Again, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 to 9. Who, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. May God bless this reading. Yes, I did get a haircut, not the one I would have liked, but I am proud to serve you. <laughs> um, I'm not, I don't have that long to uh, present this sermon. It's one that is really, it, it's been a blessing to me. Uh, and I hope it is to you as well. So let's pray to get started. Uh, Father, thank you once again for this lovely Sabbath that you gifted us. Because we're all able to participate in this lovely uh, ceremony. Uh, in which we are reminded of the sacrifice that you did for us. And how you invite us to be one with you. So be with us now. May your Holy Spirit be uh, the special guest this morning and uh, this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, is, it, is it working? Hello? Hello? Testing? Testing? Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so today's sermon title, uh, I, I decided to title it, Learning to Be a Man. I think maybe a good, uh, a better title would have been, Learning to Be a Human. Uh, I think a lot of us, when we see this, we think of ourselves, you know, especially the men uh, uh, of the house. But I'm not going to be talking about us, I'm going to be talking about God here. When we celebrate this, when we take part of this, what is this reminding us of? What does the wine remind us of? The blood of Jesus. Now, what does the bread remind us of? His body, the flesh. And so today, I want to speak about that concept. You know, the miracle of God becoming a man. God becoming a man. Now, uh, this is the world seen from the perspective of being on the moon. Can you imagine being able to see the world, you know, with, uh, on that perspective? Well, Neil Armstrong, many of you know who that is, a famous astronaut, one of the first men to uh, uh, step foot on the moon. Uh, after his trip from the moon, he was able to go to Jerusalem, which is the holy city. And he was able to take a, a tour with a, our archaeologist by the name of Ben Dove. And so when they were going through this tour, they were taking the steps that led to the temple the temple where Jesus preached, the temple where the Jews would congregate and worship. And at that moment, uh, Neil Armstrong asked, are these the steps that Jesus walked on? Which Ben Dove replied, well, Jesus was a Jew. These are the steps that lead the, to the temple. So he must have walked here many times. Armstrong uh, was perplexed. So these are the same steps that Jesus walked on. And to which he famously replied, I am more excited stepping on these stones than I was stepping on the moon. When we read John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, 
full of grace and truth. When we read the first um, passages of the Bible of how God was in the beginning, dwelt with man, was able to speak face to face, you know, eat with them, walk with them. It's a vis it's an image that we really can't grasp now, today, because non none of us have heard the voice of God. None of us have seen the face of God. But we believe, we have come to believe that there was a moment in human history where God left heaven. We don't understand how, but he became a man and dwelt with us. Now that should amaze us. That should. There were only a few uh, uh, exceptions in which God revealed himself. And even when he did reveal himself, it wasn't it entirely. You know, when Moses was with, with God in the, in the mountain, uh, what did God do? He showed him his back. And even just by beholding his back, uh, Moses almost died at that moment. He, he fell. He was uh, astounded by the glory. And so what did God do? God did not just show us his back. What did God do? He lived with us. He descended from heaven to this world. So we have been witnesses of, of even further glory than Moses was when he was here on earth. Hebrews 5, 7. This is an image. I don't have a lot of time, but Hebrews 5, 7. This is something we have to really understand uh, and, and, and grasp because when we talk about God's incarnation, sometimes it's become too familiar. It's become too common. Uh, it's something that stops amazing us. It's something that we stop thinking about. But it, it, it should because God is our creator. God is our father. God is uh, uh, omnipotent. God is uh, omniscient. Um, God is omnipresent. Hebrews 5.7 portrays a different God than what we read in the Old Testament. It does. It, sound, it kind of seems like it's showing us a different God, totally different people. Why? Hebrews 5, 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, to, to his father, who was able to save him from death uh, and was heard because of his godly fear, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And this is where I want to enter back to the title of the sermon. We believe that God is omniscient, right? God is all-knowing. We do believe that, right? And this might be some, a little difficult for us to understand because we always have this picture of God knowing everything. Theoretically, God knew what it was to be a man. He knows the past, the future. Theoretically, he knows what it is to be a man. Yet, God lacked something, the experiential knowledge. And so, God puts himself in a position where he has to learn what it is to be a human. We read that right there. Though he was a son, yet he learned, he learned obedience. And so, when we think of the God in the Old Testament that descended with, with, with thunder, you know, rumbling in the mountains, uh, his voice, you know, shake the earth. And now we see a God who's kneeling down, who's crying, you know, uh, nonstop, uh, and crying to the Lord, pouring himself out. It, it, it should, you know, touch our hearts, that image. And... St. Augustine puts it in a really nice way. He's a theologian back, back in the days. Uh, he says, man's maker was made, uh, was made man that he, ruler of the stars, might nurse at his mother's breast, that the bread might hunger, the fountain thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on his journey, that truth might be accused of fault witnesses, the teacher be beaten with whips, the foundation be suspended on wood, that strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded, that life might 
die. And so this is a very powerful uh, quote that St. Augustine uh, shares with us, especially that last part, that life might die. Now that's something uh, that really is perplexing. It, it befuddles us. How is that the giver of life dies? And, before, and, you know, before I continue with this, there is a question. Uh, there are many passages in the Bible that teaches us that uh, Jesus tempt, was tempted as we were, right? Can I get an amen? Yeah? Uh, but we also have passages that say, that, that tells us that God cannot be tempted. Right? Amen? Amen? Now, how do we explain that? How do we explain that? That's a problem. That, that creates a problem with us. Because if God can't be tempted the same way we are, he can't, be con he can't connect with us. He can't be our high priest. And to be tempted would go against his nature, wouldn't it? That creates a problem. God is able to be tempted because he puts himself in this unique position of becoming a man. C.S. Lewis was a prolific theologian. He puts it this way. Uh, and here comes the catch. Only a bad person needs to repent. Only a good person can repent perfectly. The worse you are, the more you need it, and the less you can do it. The only person who could do it perfectly would be a perfect person, and he would not need it. Somebody understanding this? No? Our sinful nature. We need to repent. Uh, but because we're so corrupted and sinful, we're unable to do it on our own. But a perfect person, God, Jesus, who can do it perfectly, does not need it because he is perfect. And so he goes on to say, the same badness which makes us need it makes us unable to do it. Unfortunately, we now need God's help in order to do something which God, in his own nature, never does at all. To surrender, to suffer, to submit, to die. All these things which God calls us to do, to surrender, to suffer, to submit, to die, are against his nature. In the Old Testament, where do we see God doing this? When do we see him surrendering? We never see that. When do we see ourselves submitting himself to somebody else? Nowhere. Now, where in the Old Testament do we find um, God dying? Nowhere. It's only in the New Testament when there's a transition in human history. Nothing in God's nature corresponds to this process at all. So that the one road for which we now need God's leadership most of all is a road God in which, his own, in, in, which his, in his own nature, has never walked. God can share only what he has. This thing in his, in his own nature, he has not. He can't share these things. He has not experienced it. And this is where, oh, it's a little small there, but I'm going to read. But supposing God became a man. When I was reading this, this is just, you know, I was like, no, no, he did not. You know, he, he brought us to this crescendo in this quote. But supposing God became a man. Suppose our human nature, which can suffer and die, was amalgamated with God's nature in one person. Then that, could, that person could help us. He could surrender his will and suffer and die because he was a man. And he could do it perfectly because he was God. Amen? Jesus did the impossible. You know? And now, through the Holy Spirit, we can become one with God. Be amalgamated with God. God is both further from us and nearer to us than any other being. Even now. It's amazing to see what God did because of him, because of this miracle of becoming a man, dwelling with us, becoming flesh, being here on earth, 
we're able to have access to something that we didn't have before, and that is the kingdom of heaven. And I want to end with Desire of Ages, 25, uh, page 25. Uh, Ellen G. White uh, writes this, By his life and his death, Christ has achieved even more than recovery from the ruin wrought through sin. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man, but in Christ we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. Did you catch that? I'm going to read that again. Uh, but in Christ we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. In taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, he is linked with us. He gave him not only to bear our sins and to die as our sacrifice, he gave him to the fallen race, um, to become one of the human family, forever to retain his human nature, forever. No, forever. God has adopted human nature in the person of his son and has carried the same into the highest heaven. Isn't that amazing? God confined himself to this human nature. And, you know, when I think of the spiritual, uh, of the dimensions that exist, we have God, we have the angels, and at the bottom, human, right? God just jumped that level. Uh, uh, of being an angel, he, he chose the lowest you know, to become a man forever to retain this nature. And we're connected with him. And so when we go through challenges, when we face uh, temptations, when we face uh, 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 a breaking of the heart, God can relate to all of that. God can connect, even to this day. And that's just amazing. When we think of the flesh and, and the blood, we're reminded of what God did for us, of how he's united with us, not just in relationship, but physically as well. God is united with us. And so as we're going to uh, celebrate this ceremony and be part of it, Let's be reminded, this is an act of humility. When we watch our, our brother or our sister's uh, feet, God did the most humble thing here. Uh, he became a man. And he took that form for forever. And so we're going to uh, break for this part of the ceremony now. But before we do, I want to end with a prayer. So let us pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the love and your mercy that you show for us. For becoming a man. Sometimes we take that miracle and, and it becomes too common, we become too familiar with it. But it just amazes me that in your plan of salvation, you intentionally left heaven. You intentionally left your throne to dwell here, to suffer, to die. You learned what it, it is to cry human tears. And so thank you for that because, because of that, it's a God we can relate to. So be with us now as we celebrate what you did for us. And because of that, we're connected with you in a stronger way. And we are offered a, 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 a salvation that once wasn't uh, obtainable for us. And that is being by your side in the kingdom of heaven. So be with us now and allow us to enjoy this and, and rejoice in, in this communion. In Jesus' name we pray.